everyone can hear me all okay. Hi, George. Um, okay, let me just... There we go, you're unmuted now. There we go. I'm so sorry about that. That was technical worries. That's, that's Zoom for you. <laughs> um, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, for a really special edition of the Riverside Studios Film Club. Um, so just a few housekeeping things for, to start with. Um, if everyone can stay on mute, that's really helpful just for um, noise and making sure that we can just hear each other really well. And if you um, use the speaker view, that's probably the best way for you to see George and his reactions. Um, and for questions, we're going to be doing a chat function, which is um, so on the bottom hand of your screen, you've got chat at the bottom. So if you type in your question there, um, then I'll just be picking people at random throughout. Um, so we're going to be sort of starting with an introduction um, to George and um, his um, why he's picked No Country for Old Men by the Coen Brothers as his favourite film for this edition of Film Club. Um, and, um, and then we'll go to some questions afterwards. Um, so yeah, really Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's really, really happy to see you here tonight. Um, and um, yeah, so first of all, um, just want to ask you, um, well, firstly, um, I'll just intro you a little bit. Um, as everyone knows, um, George um, was most recently in 1917, which won an Oscar, um, and he worked with Sam Mendes on that. And um, before that, he was in The True History of the Kelly Gang, which was, um, um, a Toronto Film Festival film um, and he's worked with some amazing actors already at the start of his career. He's worked with um, Saoirse Ronan in How I Live Now um, and um, in Captain Fantastic um, which is uh, another indie Sundance Film Festival favourite um, and that was um, with Viggo Mortensen um, so that was an incredible film. Um, and yeah, made your debut in um, Peter Pan when you were, is it 13 years old? If that's right. 10, boy, 10, 10, 10, 10 to 11, yeah, it was time. Oh, okay. Um, so that was your debut and then gone on to do some incredible films working with amazing um, actors, uh, Private Peaceful, You're in Defiance with Daniel Craig, um, like some incredible career feats already um, at such a young age. Um, so yeah, tonight we'll be actually talking about No Country for Old Men. Um, so that's um, a, the same cinematographer for 1917, Roger Deakins. Um, and yeah, so firstly, I'd just love to hear a little bit about um, why No Country for Old Men was one of your favorite um, cinema, cinema uh, one of your favorite cinema experiences. I think, I don't, it's difficult to put a, a finger on it. I just remember I went to I went to see it when it came out, which we were saying when we spoke earlier today. We were surprised how long ago it is now mm. that it came out. And I remember, you know, that the last night. If everyone's just I don't know if everyone's just watched it with you know Tommy Lee Jones kind of goes, and then I woke up, and I remember going like <laughs> and dropping into my chair and not realizing that the whole film I'd been getting like closer and closer and closer to the screen, and was just so engrossed. I just thought the whole. It was, it was mainly that physical feeling of not realizing how affected I'd been by it until the credits began to roll and that you were sort of snapped out of the spell. But I think that's it, you're kind of under a spell for the whole thing. And, and I love that world, I love that kind of like Texan, modern Western um, environment and, and landscape and culture. And, and, and I love the kind of, I guess this sort of beautiful, strangeness in a lot of ways of, of, of the Coen brothers sort of tone and, and their characters and Javier Bardem I'd never seen in anything else at that point and was just like blown away by this fantastically bizarre detailed um this is an amazing amazing character and, and it's just got such a great cast in general like I think Josh Brolin's amazing in it and Kelly MacDonald is fantastic and then you've got Woody Harrelson it just gets it just unfolds and it gets better and better and better. So, so I think that for all for all of those reasons, it's it's my favorite favorite cinema experience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Seeing it recently, it just felt so fresh, um, and um, just does something so different with a 
like the standard Western narrative um, mm -hmm. where there's no clear cut um, winners or losers and the main character is killed off and it's you know oh, that never oh, happens oh, oh, it was so shocking how, how i mean there's no it's a spoiler alert for anyone who's you know who maybe hasn't seen the film but it's um it happens it's it's kind of so true of life in a way that you the, you know without giving too much away that you know the person that you're essentially with the whole film you're not even aware when it happens you just sort of find them along the way like someone else and it's so it suddenly kind of, it's quite profound because it sort of highlights the the anonymity of you know of 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 the situation of and also I I'm, I I love stories where you kind of the point of it is is that if you weren't focused on them you wouldn't you wouldn't know what was going on you know and it's every everyone's every person's every day is epic and epic to them and to their loved ones and to the people involved in that story but we're passing by people all the time that we have no clue what they're going through or what they might have done and there's so many moments in that even when he's crossing the border and you know he's he's kind of in bits physically you know it's almost he's on his last legs and he borrows a jacket and you know lifts a corona and to anyone else he just looks like he's had a big night out but you don't know that the kind of he's been running for his life for the last couple of days and he's kind of on his last legs physically i just love that thing of the way that you you know we miss we miss each other in life as well it's a kind of it's a beautiful sadness in a lot of ways but it's just you know, there's too many people in the world to be able to concentrate on everyone all the time, you know, through your own eyes. And that the film sort of has that, has this scope and this magnitude because of the landscape and the massiveness of the story and, and how sort of random it is in a lot of ways. And then is is so, so intimate. And a lot of the kind of the biggest chase sequences are so tight and so taut. Um, yeah, it's, I just think it's wonderful. Yeah, and the sort of the, the randomness that you say in terms of um, how Javier Bardem is playing with people's lives in the coin toss. Yeah. Uh, and it's such a different um, way of looking at the classic um, chase between um, in, a, in a Western. Um, and it's, but it's beautiful as well because it's that double level where it's not just like a scary character. It's because it's the double thing of he's playing with life in a, in a coin toss. But what's even scarier or sorts of thrilling as a viewer is the person playing that game doesn't know that that's what the game is. Mm. You know, there's this beautiful scene and, and this guy's going, well, what do I stand to lose? He's going everything. And he's like, well, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, are we talking money? Are we talking life? Are we talking my shop? Are we talking hours? Like, you know, it's, and that, there's that beautiful tension that about sort of misunderstanding that he, he has no idea what he's talking about, but we as the viewer know exactly what his intentions are. Yeah. Like. And yeah, it's Kelly McDonald's character who does actually, she yeah. actually knows and she's more aware. And even though she doesn't have a huge um, character, you know, like such a, such a big role in it, mm. they sort of, they make sure that she has that, mo she's more aware. She's, she's not just going to be like that shopkeeper that is happy to um, let that coin be tossed um, for, his, for his life. She's, she's already aware that um, what Javier Bardem is going to be doing. Yeah. Uh, with that there's this yeah sort of like more enlightened there's a there's, there's i think it's such a beautiful line where she's she sees him and she just goes I, I think i need to sit down and it's like it's so it's so it's so honest it's so um it's because she knows exactly what's going on which gives her a huge amount of sort of power and weight and wisdom but then there's a, like a very honest vulnerability and like i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna fall over you know so it's just that kind of an acknowledgement of the situation is is oftentimes so rare in life when you kind of completely name something you're not being enigmatic or you're not you know using it or anything like that when you're just honest it really sort of is very moving i think um because we recognize it even though it and perhaps recognize it didn't happen fully that often um especially with big stuff and so when she sort of acknowledges that she's she you knows how scared she is it's, it's i find it really moving Mm, yeah yeah and she says that line which is i know this uh, but not exactly verbatim but i know this this isn't done yet like yeah. she's got that yeah that awareness yeah, yeah um but yeah and so how how does how did um this film inspire any of your um career choices because there there is a, a sort of similarity in the the grittiness of the role that you took in the true history of the kelly gang um and um, in in the war films as well, in sort of in that sort of 
um, in the violent side of different characters that you take on um, and, and the sort of the willingness to move into a ground, a, an area which is um, maybe more outside of your human experience and something which is more to the level of the extremes. So like, did this film have an impact on any of your choices later on? Definitely, I think, I think subconsciously. I think um, I, I was sort of realized watching it last night that there's been so many scenes which I'd forgotten were in the film, which have been sort of vignettes in my head or kind of ideas for other things or references to maybe kind of things that I've wanted to try, you know, in, in my own work um, and not realize sort of where the inspiration, like how literal the comparisons were some of the time. Um, but I, th I think, yeah, I think what I love about the film and kind of look for you know, first and foremost, it's amazing to have any sort of choice in, in work. But what I like to either to be a part of or just to read or to watch or to listen to is a kind of lyricism to stuff, like a kind of poetic, slightly folkloric. It's that kind of, it's a very real situation, but told very lyrically. And there's a real poetry to it, like a film like The Selfish Giant or something. Or I did a film a few years ago called For Those in Peril, which is like a real working class fishing town in the top of Scotland, but it's about a fairy tale essentially. And there's a magical beast at the end. And it's kind of, it's that, it's that sort of thing or, or Pan's Labyrinth where, you know, you go, I think magic is really amazing and, and life is full of magic. And when it happens in those very kind of down to earth, um, gritty, often working class scenarios, I think that sort of offsets it beautifully. And I guess there's, I like, big performances, like subtle and big performances as well, in terms of, you know, you see, I remember auditioning for a director once and he talked about Paul Thomas Anderson films and says there's always one massive performance. Like, and if, when I was thinking back, I was like, yeah, if, like Joaquin Phoenix in, in The Master, he's like, we was like that the whole time. And it's massive, but it's genius. Or like Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood, it's kind of huge what he's doing, but it's so subtle and well realized that it's, it's amazing. And, and I think Javier Bardem was that sort of similar level of it's kind of extraordinary and almost caricature in some ways, and yet so nuanced and subtle and human and real um, uh, and others. So I think that kind of, I guess, the lyricism of the whole thing, the big and small nature of the performances in it, and also I think coming from a sort of like, you know, upper middle class background, I think I'm sort of like, I very, I know this is going, maybe this is going to sound um, sort of almost like patronizing or soft, but like, I think, I think as I get older and I realized how sort of, I guess, rarefied elements of my upbringing were, I, I really admire craft and, and sort of characters and people that are resourceful and Josh Brolin's character in it and the way that he is so resourceful, I just really love. And I think it's a kind of very simple uh, simple wit in a way, the way that he kind of hides things and he has an Annette or builds things and the way, the way he handles his weapon, um, the way he kind of patches it, the way they patch themselves back together or the way that he makes the hook to hide the, the, um, the uh, like the, the money bag and all that kind of stuff. I just think a resourcefulness as I get older is something that I'm sort of hoping to, hoping to get better at just in all elements of life and work. Um, mm. and so, uh, uh, and so, yeah, I'm always, I was struck again watching it again last night how resourceful all the characters are because I love this the sequence again is I mean it's sort of inhuman in a sense but amazing the sequence of Javier Bardem just piecing himself back together that gunshot wound and laying the you know and it's all done in silence and it's also that thing of it's so subtle you feel the pain because of how beautifully it's shot as well but all of that sequence when he's the, the you know how much that would hurt in his leg and yet he's sort of basically he doesn't do anything but he's kind of it's the tension in his body but just that that whole sequence of him patching himself back together um and and even how he steals everything it just yeah anyway i'm rambling yeah. but usefulness is one thing yeah. that I like in the film yeah definitely um and just yeah going back to what you said about um no music which is such a, a huge thing for cinema to not have but it just focuses so much on the characters and the shadows and um, the chase and mm. it doesn't need anything more than that um, 
And as you said, it's it's like the foot, the sort of the close-ups on some of the gory details, and then it moves into complete omission of um, some of the deaths that are happening, so that you're, you know, completely unaware of some some of the parts of the plot, and you have to piece it together yourself I, um, I, later on. Yeah, I, th I think the like the no music thing as well. Like, I don't know if I mean I wouldn't know what the Coen Brothers sort of exactly were we're trying to do but there's something and maybe this is a bit of a typical read on it but it feels kind of more art house because of that like it's oftentimes when you watch sort of more you know I, I don't know art house films I guess there's it's there's a very sparse quality to them and the yeah, fact well, then, that kind of, then I'll do... oh sorry sorry <laughs> yeah no just sort of a a pull back austerity mm. um sort of aesthetic to it yeah yeah and there's a kind of rawness to it then which I think the fact that this is made by such fantastic makers you know the likes of the Coen brothers and Roger Deakins and that cast that's assembled is so you know massive and kind of weighty and the story is so big and weighty the fact that it has that kind of sparseness to it really it kind of makes it feel feel very elevated as well it stops that kind of like you know you can just imagine it would be a whole different shot if Josh Brolin squatted down in his checks with his binoculars and you hear like a like like guitar chords or something it would suddenly be a bit like kind of we're watching a western but it's you're just completely in the environment all the time yeah yeah for sure um and yeah I mean I'm, we could pass to the, the first question actually because this sort of leads on to um from um Alexander McPherson um, Georgia, who's, um, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself, it might take a minute. Um, there we go. Hello. Yeah, Hello. Um, I was just wondering, you know, you seem to like the Coen Brothers a lot, and would there be a favourite movie of theirs that you would have loved to be part of? Is there a movie, apart from No Country for Old Men, like, is there a particular movie of theirs that you wish you would be part of? There's, um, I think, um, well, if it can't be No Country for Old Men, that would definitely be my first go-to answer. I think I'm still kind of, I love the Coen Brothers, but I'm admittedly still catching up with all of their back catalogue. It was only, I think, the year before last when I saw The Big Lebowski. Um, but I think maybe Barton Fink, um, I have a soft spot for that. We did a, it was actually at school. We, um, um, my drama teacher, and Mr. Parker did a version of Macbeth that we took to the Edinburgh Film Festival, which was a sort of take on Barton Fink, where Macbeth was a very neurotic hotel manager, um, and his his wife made him take over the hotel from Duncan, who was the big hotelier, and the whole set was like briefcases and stuff. And we had an amazing time at school, and then taking it up to Edinburgh. So I reckon to be a part of Barton Fink, maybe that would be a that would, that would be the one. Yeah, Barton Fink is. An incredible Coen Brothers film. It's one of the best, and yet slightly underrated. I feel underneath. Yeah, yeah, I think one of the bigger. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not a sort of big film, but again, it's just sort of so. It's so surreal at certain points. I like surreal stuff in you know in in general. Um, and uh, yeah, the scene with like the bur the burning corridor and everything. It's yeah, it's it's amazing. And John Turturro in it is incredible. Hmm. Um, yeah. Do you think that? Um, like sort of who would be your ideal directors to work with? Um, like would the Coen brothers be part of that? Um, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many, there's so many, like um, it's difficult to kind of call out folk. I mean, Steve McQueen, like I loved Hunger um, and, and I mean, all of Steve McQueen's work, but particularly Hunger. And I've sort of heard about yeah, that he has a, you know, a very concentrated way of working um, and I just think he's an amazing artist. So Steve McQueen and I, I watched um, um, Honey Boy this year. That was a film that was also at Toronto Film Festival. And that's by a director called Alma Harrell, who's made some amazing documentaries too. Um, so maybe like, I'd love to work with Alma Harrell or, you know, also, the, you know, the big guns like Paul Thomas Anderson, all that kind of stuff. I mean, but I mean, the list, you know, the list goes on. There's, yeah. there, there could be loads. Yeah, and Steve McQueen actually worked um, at Riverside Studios itself. Oh, kidding. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a good link. I didn't know that. Yeah, I think he was in the box office. No uh, kidding. Yeah, because um, you you live just across the river from Riverside, so is it sort of you sort of grew up with that as your local cinema? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I grew I grew up just um, just across the river, 
and I've been, I've been there a number of times when it was sort of in its earlier iteration. We went one time with school, it was really affected by an Ender Walsh play there that was, I think it was called The New Electric Ballroom. Um, and it's, a, if I, it's, it's about, I remember the character Paddy. I think I did a monologue of his for a drama exam. Um, I think it was my GCSE drama. But that was an amazing performance there about, I think it's a mother and a daughter who never leave the house in, 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 in Ireland. Um, Paddy is a local fisherman who comes by a sort of neurotic um, fisherman. Um, I think he's agoraphobic or something. It's like, I can't remember exactly, but I just remembered this guy's performance just being electric, no, no pun intended. Um, and then I'm a big Jeff Buckley fan as well. And there was a great Jeff Buckley documentary, which I've never found again, which was on at the cinema there um, years and years and years ago. Mm. Okay, we're going to go to another question now from um, the audience. Okay, let me... Um... Uh, Aisha Servia, um, if you can unmute yourself if you want to ask it. Um, all right. Hi. Hi. Um, all right. Uh, my question is, what moments in the film felt like master classes in building suspense to you? And which scenes had you holding your breath? Because I found myself holding my breath quite a lot throughout the film. It's, it's like super intense. So just wanted to know. I think probably the biggest one is that sequence. Um, it's, a great, it's a great question. I think the the, the one where he gets to the, uh, the the big hotel and it's that sort of old school hotel. And he he asks the night the night what like kind of night porter. He says, Are "You on all night?" And he he tells him a fib about being a cop. Just can you look out for anyone? And he sat there, and he wakes up and he suddenly realizes that there there must be a tracker in the bag. And he rifles through and he finds the tracker. And as he's holding it, it starts to beep closer and closer and closer. And then it's just the silence of realizing it's like a shark coming towards you, but you can't see it. And then the two feet underneath, you know, underneath the, uh, the crack in the doorway and just watching that with his gun and then the feet going away and you kind of breathe out and then the whole corridor goes black. And you're just like, oh no, because he knows exactly, he knows if he's watching. And I love that sort of mutual, Again, it's all about mutual understandings. Like there's a real tension in like a mutual understanding, but you only see one side of it. With that thing of it's kind of like they feel that the other one's watching the other one. And, and another beautiful example of that is, I think when Tommy Lee Jones is going into the motel room where Lu that Llewellyn has been in and Javier Bardem is waiting in the room and he can tell that he's obviously been there because it's that telltale thing of having the doorknob blown in. And it's that kind of shot from inside and you can sort of see Tommy Lee Jones reflection inside the circle of the, where the doorknob was. And you've got that kind of slightly manic face of Javier Bardem waiting in the shadows. And that scene never really sort of comes to anything and you don't know how and when he's escaped. But it, again, to me, that's sort of a bit of magic in a way, is, is that thing of like, were we watching, like I don't find that alienating, I find that really intriguing, that thing of like, was I watching them in the same time scale or? Was he there? Did he know he was there? Because they seemed to know, they seemed to sort of almost respect that the other one was in there. Because I felt like Tommy Lee Jones, when he took his gun out, having seen the way he's entered into places before, is kind of like, almost like, I know I'm going to meet it now. I know I'm going to, I know this is it. And he goes in there and there's no one there. And he sort of, and it's kind of like, you know, have your by them's character Anton has, has disappeared and is like, is like a ghost. So I reckon the bit in the hotel and the following chase um, outside and into the car. Um, and then that, that section with Tommy Lee Jones going into the, the hotel room that, that Llewellyn was in. Right, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thanks for that, Aisha. Um, so maybe we'll turn to Ellie Yun now. Um, she wants to unmute herself or we can read it out. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, I want to ask if you could apply for an audition for this movie, yeah. what role yeah. would you like to play? Oh, it's really hard because it's one of those ones where if you, I, I'm almost like, well, one, you could never like, only the actors that play them could dream up the performances they give. So I would love to be capable of Javier Bardem's performance in it and that level of comedy and 
terrifying this but i think because of the sort of need and want to be a bit more um uh, resourceful i'd go for llewellyn um and i'd like to i'd like to play a you know a texan so I, i'd say i'd audition for llewellyn hope that i could give the performance that javier bardem gave but if not i think i'd be happy to be i'm just happy to be in it so maybe tommy lee jones is friend who lives with all the cats so maybe that way that you can be in it and keep everything sort of pretty much as it was and that actor gave an amazing performance but just to have that sort of back and forth so anyway that's a long way back I'd, I'd, I'd audition for Llewellyn um, but I wouldn't change a thing about the film anyhow. Thank you. Um, Juan Wu Lee if I've got that pronunciation right um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question. Mm, maybe Hello. not. Maybe I'll ask it. Um, so um, they've put, there are actors who just snap out of their roles when the director says cut, and there are actors who completely who are completely immersed in their character um, afterwards. What type of actor would you say you are? Uh, I think it's particular to the experience. I think the last few roles it, it it changes depending on the character and depending on what you've been asked to do for the you know for the role. The circumstance is all. I think I'm, I'm trying, I'm enjoying more and more getting engrossed in the experience of filmmaking and engrossed, therefore, in the character that I'm playing. But I guess sort of it's almost like it's like it's like getting into shape. And then, you know, it takes two months to to get into shape and you get fit and you go running every day and all that kind of stuff. And then over Christmas, you can undo it in about a week. And it's a bit like that, you know, where it takes, it takes ages to sort of get in the headspace and of doing the role. But I find that at the end of it, there's sort of a large po portion of you that can turn, off, turn it off very quickly because I think you're sort of ready to let it go. But, uh, but there, there's other aspects of it that, that stick with you. And I think, and I think that's okay because I think it's like a form of learning. Like it's in the same way that it's almost like a relationship or something, you know, you you sort of spend time with with the person you have experiences with them and then you know if it if it ends and you you take the good bits and you and you move on with those and that's that's okay mm. um but i think i think uh, also another thing to be said is that there's also just the simple thing of occupation with a job of like a character might be your reason to get out of bed it might be your reason to read that book or practice those words or to you know go for a run and i think that's that's a big thing that's almost like not as obvious because you're not performing anymore but i find that the, the occupation of immersing yourself into something is is just as big as the sort of doing it in itself doing it in, in itself in a way and that that in almost is harder to let go of the fact that you sort of suddenly your time is yours there's not you are your own boss and you're the biggest thing where for a long time it's quite helpful to make something else or some other character bigger than you you know Mm. It may, you know it gets you out of bed in the morning mm. yeah because for um playing ned kelly you were you really had to push yourself to the limit there didn't you mm. in terms of like just the the sort of mental toll that it takes on um playing that type of character yeah yeah it's 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 funny like it's you know but like that i i was practicing my australian accent for weeks before shooting and then by the end then did it every day that I was on set. And then by the end of it, kind of was even doing an offset. <clears throat> and so you're sort of talking in someone else's voice all the time. And then also we had to look a certain way. So there was a very regimented diet. And it was a kind of, it was just a weird thing, that initial thing where I remember 48 hours after the job, I drunk more beer than I'd had in seven months. Mm. In 24, you know, in 48 hours by having a couple of pints at the rap party. And suddenly I was speaking in a voice that I hadn't spoken in for six months. And it's not like a gradual, like, we'll do a little bit of that every day for the next two weeks and then we'll change. It was like a light switch. And that was sort of a bit disorientating for a minute. But, you know, mm. but, then, but, then it, but then you sort of level out the next ways. Then sort of time opens up and it kind of, it coasts for you. Yeah. Um, that's good to hear because often when, if you, if you see um, 
actors that are playing such difficult roles, you sort of think, how does it not have a, a toll on your mental well-being? But if you if you're able to split it like that, then um, yeah, like sort of seeing interviews with Javier Bardem and you know what an in incredible the most dark psychotic role he could play but then mm. when he goes on stage and he accepts the prize he's got that his his spanish spirit and his hearty laugh and it all comes back and you see that it, he is who he is and he's you know that sort of power of um an actor yeah i, I think that's yeah. just that that comes with like i think that comes with experience because i've had certain times where you know it's it takes a wee while to let go and things hang on for a long time or um and that's also how much you kind of dedicate you know yourself to it in in the doing you know sometimes if you also get more practice at being able to jump in jump out quicker and therefore in some ways and and again that's all applicable to what's going on in your life like like with Ned the purpose of that time I wanted only to go and throw everything at that role and you know if Nathan I was you know if if in the future I've got kids at home or something like that I won't be able to kind of go yeah for two and a half months in Australia I'm going to ride a horse and be on a farm like because your, your just priorities are different. And that's where you, I guess you need to practice the craft over time so that you can kind of adapt to the, the performance's situation and your own situation. Yeah, definitely. We'll go to another question now. Um, uh, Divis, sorry, Divis Sober, Hadeep Bika, um, if you want to unmute yourself, um, or if not, I can ask out your question. Oh, hello. Hi. Hi, Mimi. Hi, yeah. Me. <laughs> so, which one of my questions should I ask? <laughs> uh, the one I just saw was the one about um, the sort of the paying close attention to detail and whether you catch everything in first viewing. That one. Okay. So, the movie requires very close attention of the audience, mm. and did you catch all the tiny details, like what ends up with? Clara Jean's face on the first time when you were watching it? Um, no, I don't think I did. And I think that's credit to the film. Um, I think I took a huge amount from that first watch in terms of was very moved by it emotionally and, and sort of awed by it as an experience and thrilled. But, it, uh, you know, Olivia and I were talking just earlier today briefly and it's the, the movie deepens every time. And I think there's sometimes... Um, uh, you kind of, I guess what sometimes when you know what's going to happen, you sort of, and this might, I could be getting these, some of these wrong, but so you start to sort of draw lines or see metaphors, you know, throughout, like, I don't know, like even that, that thing of the, you know, the first time you see Llewellyn, then there's a shot of an animal and a target straight after. And sort of when you know what the purpose of his character is, you suddenly go, ah, oh, that's a kind of, for, in a way, it's sort of like a foreboding or, or a, a premonition. And then, the whole thing that, you know, one of the last things that his wife says is that, you know, I knew that you can't outrun this, you know, and that it's always coming, coming to you. And, and, you know, that's, that could be even like in the way that there's a storm head, like in the distance when that, when he's down at the kind of where the, the, the drug deal has gone down. There's, so, there's so many things. I started listening to Tommy Lee Jones stories a bit more where, um, you know, when I first, first watched it, I was just kind of like, what was he saying you know and you, you're just kind of taken up by a bit like the characters in the film kind of going what was that and then when you sort of know the ins and outs of what the story is exploring you start to you kind of you 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 start pulling apart and, and looking for the meaning in in everything because it's all I imagine it's you know it's been so beautifully put together so it was less sort of I guess less specific images or sounds necessarily but more the content of what the characters were we're saying I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah and I've um, read a little bit about how lots of film goers were unhappy about the ending of um, No Country for Old Men. They thought it was quite anticlimactic um, because it, it ends on a, on a dream and and it sort of it plays into that um, Cone Brothers humour and just a humour in general that no one's really interested in anyone else's dream. And to end on, on that film, uh, on that film, uh, at the end is just like a little, um, a nice bit of humour, but also it has got a huge amount of significance. Um, yeah. And I just wondered what, what your thoughts were on the end of the film itself. 
I sort of like, yeah, I think with a lot of people, I used to say like, oh, I love that film. Do you get the ending? No, I don't get the ending. Like, and, but that's fine because it's sort of somehow perfect. I, but, and so I was sort of waiting for it a bit more. And, and I, I think I kind of keyed into Tommy Lee Jones's character stories a bit more throughout this time. And I think that it's kind of, I, I, you know, I, I still can't say for sure what it is, but it's, um, I get that there seems that the, the themes of the film that kind of came true is this idea of, of sort of running towards your future and that thing of like, you're heading towards something that you can't escape. And because you can't escape it, it's sort of behind you and it's sort of chasing you. And that sort of cyclical nature of heading towards something that you, a destiny that you can't change. And you're sort of being propelled by that. So you're sort of like that destiny and there's that, that second, you know, the, the dream that he talks about of his father seems to have that kind of circular notion in terms of he says to his wife as well, you know, it's, he was, um, you know, he was, he was the age he was when he died. So now I'm the old, now he's the younger man. And so uh, weird that it's kind of, he's watching his father now beyond the age that his father was throughout his life. And then he's going on ahead and he goes down with his head past and he's heading on over and he just says, I am, um, you know, he I don't know where he's going, but I know that he said, I just got the sense that he was going to have a camp a fire lit with me and he'd be ready for when I get there. And it sort of seems like Tommy Lee Jones's character throughout can't really understand the, the, the rationale or the meaning behind what Anton Shakur is, Shakur is doing. And he sort of is struggling with morality in that sense of like, I don't, I don't get why people are tearing themselves apart. And, he's sort of mulling this over this sort of senseless circular killing um, and mortality. And then he himself at the end of it has finished his job and it was the last job and it was sort of unsolved and unfinished, but it just finished, but yet it's still kind of going sort of a bit like him, I guess. And he's, he's sort of the end of his working life, which is who, who he was as a man. And now he's, not doing that so where's he going to go but he's at the beginning of the end and it's you know and he's there's a sort of hope in that there'll be something for him at the end but at the same time it's unknowable but he just got he's just got a sense of it and that that so I guess that sort of circular notion of mortality and heading for a destiny that you're sure is there but you're not sure what it is yeah. kind of but then again just told over coffee in a kind of whimsical story like that's, yeah you know, I think there's the, there's a real emotion behind his eyes. There's a sort of like, there's a sort of almost, he looks like a wee boy at the end of it, I think. I think he's played so beautifully because he doesn't really understand it, but he he knows what it is. And it almost a bit like Kelly McDonald's character where she goes like, I knew this was going to come. And you know, you don't know, you, you can't know it until you meet it. Um, and until you do, that that's just, you just are, you're sort of in the present. And that's a little bit like the film is that you're not at the end of the film because life keeps going. Yeah, I think you really touched on something there in terms of like sort of calling him the little boy because there is so much vulnerability there and he's he's just so sad about the state of affairs and about the lack of morality in the world. And it's a post Vietnam world um, yeah. where people have seen monstrosities. Um, mm. And even after that, there's no, there's no piece that's going to bring them together. There are people like Javier Bardem's character that are going to walk around and play with people's lives in chant, you know, and there's and a character um, who's chasing money and it's, you know, it's, it's just everything doesn't um, match his expectations of, of um, where you have the heroes and the villains and there's nothing clear cut anymore. Everything is confused. Yeah. Yeah, um, morality is confused. There doesn't seem to be a, a singular sense to anything. Like there's not, there's not, there isn't a rule that fits one. There's not, a, there's not a logic that is that everyone atones to. Like the masses might atone to it, but then you get a renegade like Anton Chigurh who doesn't, and it throws everything off kilter. And it's kind of like that thing of I think it's sort of searching for a sense and the the most the most clear sense that he can make, or at least to me at least, is that there is no clear sense. But then it's kind of how you deal with that. Do you, does that, does that become too much and you stop? Or do you appreciate the sort of sense that you know and just appreciate that it might not be the sense for everyone else? Mm. And it's kind of, 
but even that is a sort of compromising thing where because I, I picked up on the conversation that he has after they've found um, Llewellyn's body and um, the kind of the county sheriff from that part of town they they have they he buys him a coffee and they're sort of two older Texan men kind of going well, it's not like it used to be I mean you know people with bones in their noses and different colored hair and it's kind of funny because they're they're not I guess it's sort of it's kind of in some ways it's like on the verge of prejudice but it's just sort of two older guys going hmm things are changing like I mean I'm it's not how it used to be. And then, but then you sort of forget that it wasn't how it was before they came along. They were the new thing once. And it's these kind of, that continuous thing. And I, and I think it's quite a brave choice in a way for, to not give a definitive answer in, in, your, in your ending. Um, yeah. That is the answer is there is no ending. Yeah. This sort of leads on to a question from Mika. Um, if, I'll, if you want to ask it, I've, unmuted you if you want to ask that question. Hi, um, so Hi. I actually picked uh, for my question a little phrase that Shigra says in the film. Um, so he says, if the rule you follow brought you to this, uh, of what use was the rule? So of course in this case you're not facing like this psycho killer um, that's asking you this question, but just in general like you have reached like success and like you've done a lot of like hard work and has paid off and like just in general what was like your your rule that brought you to this i guess <laughs> uh um that's a cool question i don't know i think it's um i don't know for me i feel i feel so lucky with in terms of work and everything with the work that i've got to do and i think it's just just being curious about about different ways of doing things and, and trying to get better and and that that's that sort of that's kind of endless really because i guess if that that's the rule that then that's the thing that doesn't change the pursuit of different ways of doing things and trying to get better at all of those ways or one of those ways for a wee while and then to kind of have all those different elements you know you might get better at stage for a bit or then get better at this kind of role or get better at method acting get better at being able to balance life and get better like you kind of you kind of pursue pursue trying to get better at certain elements of it and then it all kind of eventually comes under the umbrella thing of I guess storytelling and then that opens up to trying writing or to then maybe studying directors and I think it's just about a constant curiosity for to, to do the work and then any sort of level of success that anyone might get is sort of it's not the most successful thing that you can do is to do the work and then it's just other people's perception of you that changes and that other but what but what you were doing in the middle of that didn't change it's just i guess the view of it by others and and so yeah that one rule stays true which is to, to keep curious about getting better and and trying to understand a way of doing things and consequently the world because of the stories that you tell um that's uh yeah that, that would be it to kind of to stay, to stay curious would probably be the rule. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, and we've got a question um, from Natasha Gershon, which is um, more about your roles in general and um, sort of what was the most gratifying role to play and what was your most disappointing? Um, uh, it's, it's so, fun. like, I, I really don't know. It's a good question. I don't know, like, it changes, there's different things which um, gratifying, like, I don't know, because in some ways, like what, what kind of in hindsight becomes gratifying at the time genuinely is like the one that you're in knots about. Not because you watch it or you do it and you go, oh, that was actually, that was great or anything like that. You sort of go, but, but you feel like the lessons that it taught you that, you that you're not aware of in the doing of it really hit home you know down the line and you go ah oh, and so therefore you're so thankful for it but they were only kind of as strong as they are because at the time you know like I did a play called The Caretaker and I was terrified during it and and really anxious throughout the whole thing and it's one of the few times I'm one of the only times where I've genuinely gone I don't know if I want to go to work I'm so anxious about going to work I'm so nervous I'm not, 
I've, I'm, I'm on the verge of wanting to, you know, there, I hope there's a reason that I don't have to go in today sort of thing. And I've never had that. And almost that feeling scared me, but by sort of getting through it and, and, and doing it and actually enjoying it so much weirdly that it's sort of down the line, whenever you're having a sort of, you know, there's something that you're finding difficult, then that you draw on that and you're not, it's not gratifying in terms of like, oh yeah, that I was, you know, about the performance in the play. It's about the experience of doing it that somehow, you know, has come back. And I remember actually on that thing, Tim, I was working with an actor, Timothy Spool, and he as well was very nervous about the process. And I remember a few weeks in when I was sort of at the height of my angst, was warming up before, before going on on stage, sort of like a boxer in the wings, like, go, 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 go. because this, the character was like this really aggressive sort of machine gun fella. And, um, and he came off stage and his character's in these filthy pajamas and he just went, he whispered in my ear and just went, it's a crime if we don't enjoy it, Georgie, it's a crime. And it was so true because you thought this is like, this is, this is, this is what you want. If you have been asked as a boy, like, what do you want to do? Like, to be on that stage with that piece of writing, like, yes, with these actors, of course, I give my right, like, you know, I give my right arm to, to do that. So, um, you know, but sorry, and to go back to the question, the most gratifying, maybe um, the caretaker in a way. Um, and I don't really, I try not to have any sort of disappointments or regrets. Mm. So um, there, there is something, yeah, particularly gratifying around theatre because it's, um, you know, there's less cuts, mm. you're, it's live, you're not, you're not able to stop, you have to keep going for a couple of hours. Um, is is theatre something that you want to um, pursue a bit more of? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I feel I feel it's really important, and it's been a few years now. The caretaker was the last place, which I think was like three, four years ago. So I feel definitely very much in need of some some theatre practice because I think it's really, you know, you, as you say, you can't cut corners, um, and it's an amazing thing, uh, you know, to to perform live or to watch anything live. Um, and I really hope, you know, the other side of this pandemic, it's something that we kind of come back and and hold up and, and keep holding dear. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, people will be craving it and needing live theatre after this, for sure. Um, Rosie Val, if you want to unmute and ask one of your questions. I know you've put a few, but whichever one you want, go for it. Hi. 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 Hi, yeah. <laughs> Yes, actually, um, I wanted to ask, for some reason I found a lot of similarities in your roles. Do you think those are the roles that you are actually pursuing or maybe somehow um, you are encapsulated in a specific genre? It's in terms of like the, the through line in roles that I've done or, if, or similarities between some of the roles in, in No Country for Old Men? I think your roles. Yes, your roles, because there is there is a lot of people who think or maybe feel that your role in 1917, your role in Warehand Tosh, and for those in peril, if I pronounce it right, mm -hmm. are like so similar. There is people who think like when we're going to see George happy, <laughs> but you know, you have to, <laughs> you have to find, um, those movies like Pride and, yeah. and oh I forgot the name but there is a lot of people who f who feels like you you do basically the same role every single time like you are always struggling and you're always fighting for something and or, or you're at bed or you're in the middle of a war <laughs> I don't know <laughs> are those the roles that you actually enjoy to do yeah like, yeah I say, yeah really basically just only pick things about people in really stressful situations um I, yeah no i i do i think well i think i think it's because i can't i i know what you mean it's sort of you know you wouldn't get like i wouldn't or like myself personally or anyone wouldn't want to get down a sort of a rabbit hole of <laughs> distress but i i find like that the sort of the conflict is is you know not positive and negative i don't know like conflict is in like two things happening at once, either in a person or in a situation. Fascinating, and I think that's where really great drama comes from. Um, and, and therefore, I guess that's sort of the context, that's the sort of 
a lot of the context that I've been drawn to or the characters that I've been drawn to is people who who are going through that I guess probably just because that's what fascinates me and I guess that's what sort of rings true I guess is that sort of you have your like your your kind of rooted understanding of the world and the more you move through it I find that I keep sort of shifting and changing in certain things where even if like even if what roots you is kind of it stays stays strong you kind of it, it it's got to be fluid with the kind of the, the things that you meet the people that you meet the, the actions of the world and your understanding of your actions within the world and I don't know just that kind of that constant that constant sort of meeting of two tides is something that I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of more aware of as, as I get older, um, either in myself or in the world. And, and therefore just I'm drawn to characters and stories that are going through that sort of meeting of a couple of things at once, basically. Um, and I, and I, I guess you're right. That's, that's a sort of through line that is consistent, but I guess for my, for my own head, I'll just try and, change up the medium with which that is or the context and character that does that but but you're right I think it's sort of that is definitely a kind of through line to to the characters that either I have been asked to play or or that I seek out yeah and in terms of um yeah sort of as an actor you can easily be pigeonholed and and typecast mm. but um so what kind of like makes you really say yes to a role if you've been given something like what really will make you say yes i think it's well, it's, it's it's kind of it's pertinent to the time i think it's it's like it's a big and a small thing in terms of uh, as i get older and trying to be more conscious of you know the the world and 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 you're sort of more hey you're almost kind of more and more responsible for your for yourself as you, as you as you get older I think there's, you know, and also if there's any element of choice in work, that's a, that's an amazing thing too. And you, therefore you, I want to have an eye on basically putting myself to, to be a part of stories that, that explore something or express something that, that I want to as well. But I, it's kind of aligning yourself with, um, with a message or with a process or with a way of making things. And again, that, but then your role within that might, might often be the antagonist to that message. You know, that you might, you might, you, I think whatever you, you're a part of, whatever process, either in, in acting or in any sort of workplace or family, you're just a cog in a bigger machine or like a sort of, you know, a branch kind of as, like in a, on a tree is there's, you're, you're a small element of one big moving thing. And so therefore you just, it's about what that bigger thing is expressing or trying to do either in its process or in its, um, or in its message. And so therefore it's kind of finding something that I can align myself with that I want to explore and doing that, or then the more sort of smaller and personal level, it's about a process that, or a character that I want to try, you know, something that, uh, something that I want to try and do and like, challenge myself in or a way that I want to learn to express myself or a process of work is the other thing that's a big one as well like 1917 was one of the biggest draws was the understanding that we would rehearse for months and then with Ned Kelly one of the biggest draws was Justin Cazell and his way of working I un understood he was like I want you to go in I want you to disappear into this man and I want you to therefore go and live somewhere else talk somewhere else change how you look change how you talk everything um and that sort of i guess immersion was something i wanted to try um and then theater theater as well kind of got i want to try you know being in a space where you have to use the language where you have to use your voice where you don't get to go again and again you've got to meet to yourself and a performance like right? all of that stuff so it's either the big thing of being a small element of a story or process that you want to align yourself with or um uh, the kind of smaller, more personal process that you want to put yourself mm. in. Yeah, and you mentioned language just now. It just reminded me in No Country for Old Men, um, I, watching it recently, just I really admired their um, use of language and sort of the wordplay in yeah. the um, South and how it's and how sort of normal sentences are sort of inverted sometimes, and there's such an ease with language. Um, 
and it's just such a joy to watch. It's almost Shakespearean and theatrical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sort of like the Western dialogue and the Western script. It's just, yeah. Yeah, they seem to have a, a, like an amazing, I don't know where the Coen brothers are from, but they, they seem to use, you know, they use that, that kind of, that again, it's, it goes back to that, that's that lyricism, I guess, of the place. And they, they harness that amazingly, I think, with this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, should we go to Kamira Govanda? Might take a little minute. Okay. Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. So which question should I answer? Oh, well, ask, may I say? Um, the one that I saw were, I mean, up to you, um, but the one that I saw was um, what you've learned from the film, technically. Right. So as a film student, I wanted to ask you, um, in country, no country for old men, did you gain anything as in performance wise, technically, did you find, did you gain anything morally that could contribute to how you um, like get into your roles, things like that? Morally, I guess, or technically, or both? Anything, as long as you can answer the question. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think in terms of performance, I remember, again, like, I was so struck watching it again last night, the, the scene with um, Javier Bardem in the newsagents, or like, you know, the, the corner shop, uh, or gas station, uh, where, where he, he flips the coin. And then he sort of gives this last look as he goes. And it was just, there was a, there was a looseness to it. And, the, and a playfulness. And I think that's sort of what makes him so fantastic is there's a kind of theatricality and a playfulness and a looseness to this very strange, str I guess, um, what's the word? He's, he's very reserved in a lot of ways, but there's this kind of spark of playfulness. There's a spark of humor in him. And it made me sort of remember to keep playing with stuff not to kind of get rooted in like in a thing you know not if you're playing a baddie or playing a goodie whatever it is like not to sort of do not to play a tone but to just but to play the scene basically not to kind of play the play the sort of the color of the whole scene but but the specifics of that moment and that sort of little look back as to you know uh, um, to, to when he's talking to the man in the shop we seem so playful that that was a real sort of reminder to it um, I think, I guess, um, um, like morally, I don't know if it's a moral thing, but Tommy Lee Jones, when he's, he's reading the paper in the diner in the morning and, uh, and they said, oh, you know, sheriff, 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 there's, you know, should we go back to go like check on the bodies? And there's, there's, like, there's a thing that happened overnight. And he's, and he just says, well, has anything happened? Is there anything new, like anything new come in? And the guy goes, no, no, but should we go down there? And he's like, well, no, because nothing's changed. And, and it, there was that sort of economy in your energy in a very sort of like fair and kind way was something I think is, is important as well as you sort of getting, getting older and, you know, if responsibilities grow, you have to be, you know, economical, but fair. And, and just that sort of little moment was um, uh, that really struck home because also just the manner with which he did it. It wasn't like, oh, I can't be bothered. It was just like, do I need to go? If not, then I won't go. Um, uh, but, but then absolutely, you know, the things that he needed to do, like deliver the message personally for Kelly McDonald's character, he did himself absolutely. So um, I guess that's the morality and the technical. Right, thank you thank so you. much. It makes a lot of sense, thanks. Right. <laughs> thanks. Um, it's coming up to nine, so I think we'll end it with a final question about um, what, if you've, if you've had any discoveries during lockdown and um, if you could share them with us, if it's a film or whatever it is, yeah, that'd be really great. One discovery is I've been getting up really early and that when there's sort of like, and then sometimes going back to bed, you know, if you need like, if you need sort of quiet time, um, you know, if you're, if you're staying with your family or your loved ones, or I've been sort of going to the, I also kind of just like, like I love early mornings. And I think it's, you know, it's beautiful. It's light so early and quiet time. I've had to sort of prep for a job and, and I've needed a, a bit of sort of quiet outdoor space and because I live, um, you know, in, in London, the, the parks are pretty busy. So I find if I get up really early and head out to the park, 
and then sort of it's not there's no one there and then I can come back and go to bed and the early mornings have just been profoundly lovely uh, and, and in terms of um any film um recommendations as well if there's anything yeah, or something that you've gone back to um, um or a new discovery I think um film recommendations gosh, I think I rewatched Moulin Rouge the other day and that's so brilliant like Baz Luhrmann and then we rewatched Strictly Ballroom too and Baz Luhrmann is just joyous and genius um so Baz Luhrmann and I'm really excited for his next project I think he's making a film about about Elvis Presley and I think that would be amazing mm. uh, and so Baz Luhrmann and I've just started watching The Last Dance the the um Chicago Bulls documentary um on Netflix so um I'd say I'd say those two things for either end of the spectrum yeah and you definitely we need an uplift now so that's yeah 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 mm -hmm. uh, yeah bridesmaids was on the telly the other night that will lift your spirits that's wonderful definitely uh well thank you so much for joining us tonight that was a really really brilliant q a thank you for everyone that asked their questions um yeah. sorry i couldn't get around to everyone um but that was really brilliant and um thank you so much george for joining us um no, for this video edition um, so for, um, we host you, uh, weekly Riverside um, Film Club, so um, this is the first in a series of my favourite films with, um, but every Monday we'll do a, a, a normal um, film chat. Um, so please do join us for that and you can just register like you did for this on the website. Um, so yeah, thank you again George, that was really brilliant. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Bye.